next up will be Ashley Bartolo. She's one of the fourth year medical students from here in Utah. She's going to be presenting on ocular manifestations of plaque and neurotoxicity. She's in the exciting phase of interviewing and that sort of fun stuff and everything. So she's going to have to help us. All right, good morning. Thank you all for being here to listen to me for a second time in just a few short months. My topic today, like he, uh, Russ said, is ocular manifestations of plaquenol toxicity. I'm gonna, just for a quick overview, I'm gonna talk about case presentation. I'm gonna talk about the history of plaquenol, the guidelines for screening for patients on plaquenol, and then finish with our assessment and plan for my patient. So this is a 36-year-old woman who presented because she was worried about eye damage due to the plaquenil that she's been on for the past 18 months. Her dose is 200 milligrams, and that equates to 6 milligrams per kilogram per day, and she complains of red and green desaturation in the right eye compared to the left. She's also concerned about new onset of light showers bilateral eye pain, and repeated visual zigzags, which block out her vision and always occur in the same sequence. This phenomenon has occurred every other month for the past six months, and they are easily aborted with ibuprofen. She feels that bright sunlight and fluorescent light seems to trigger these episodes, and she notes that in the previous two or three years, she, she's had about one or two of these zigzag episodes, and without a headache that usually lasts about 30 minutes. On review of systems, she's positive for car sickness as a child and car sickness currently. She has no history of headaches ever previous to this. Her past medical history is positive for lichen planus follicularis, for which why she is taking the Plaquenil. And this photograph demonstrates the severity of this disease and suggests why she's treating it aggressively. She has no other past surgical history, no ocular medical history, and she's never been hospitalized. On examination, her visual acuity was 20 out of 20 on both sides. Her pressures were 14 and 16. Her visual fields were full to confrontation. Her extraocular movements were full. Her color testing was 9 out of 9 in both eyes. And on slip, slit lamp and fundoscopic exam, uh, it was completely normal. Her cup to disc risk ratio was 0 0.2 on both sides. Her flicker test was 37 on the, uh, the right and 36 on the left and her 10-2 visual field was also completely normal. On her multifocal ERG, you can see a few areas of depression. So, there, so you see kind of a little area here and a little area here. But on talking to Dr. Creel, he was skeptical if this was real or just a result of the tension she was experiencing, because with muscle contractions in the neck can cause dissimilar areas of depression. So a little bit about Plaquenil. It's an anti-malarial drug that's used to treat various autoimmune diseases, as you all know. But what you might not know is that Quinine was the first anti-malarial that was used for this purpose, and that was started as early as 1894. A little over 50 years ago, chloroquine and then plaquenil hydroxychloroquine fell into favor because of its more favorable side effects. And then it was the treatment broadened beyond lupus to include rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue disorders, as well as dermatologic disorders. And today it's even used for off-label for a lot of other rheumatologic diseases. The first case report of retinotoxicity was published in Hobbs by Hobbs in 1959, and the patient had been using it for malaria treatment. <coughs> Following that, about two years later, it came in, started rolling in all, a ton of reports um, that of retinotoxicity in patients who had used antimalarials for autoimmune diseases. So, the toxic effects um, of this include decreased visual acuity, visual field defects, and color vision defects. And here we kind of see a worst case scenario where you have the central scotoma with the foveal sparing, you have RPE depigmentation right here, 
and then this, the classic bullseye maculopathy over here. This is what the screening guidelines are hoping to prevent. A lot of times when they get to this point, it's going to be too late to do anything about, and a lot of the damage can be irreversible. This is another worst ca case scenario of a, M a multifocal ERG. The areas of depression go beyond just this paracentral region and go out into the periphery of the retina. So the question is how much and how long does it take for this to occur? And there hasn't been, even though people have known about this since the 1959, there haven't been a lot of studies that have been shown a lot. But a recent study came out in 2010 that involved 4,000 patients who had been on long-term Plaquenil that showed the, <coughs> the things that cause the most damage are if a patient has been had a cumulative dose of over 1,000 grams, if their daily dosage is over 6.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and if they've been on the drug for more than five years. And it also showed that the prevalence increases of plaquenil toxicity from about two to three cases out of, of 1,000 to one out of 100 cases after five years. So as far as intervention, there is not a lot of treatments that are available to reverse, there's no treatments available to reverse damage. However, reversal is often possible if the drug is stopped at a very er early stage of functional loss. However, there has been reports of continued depigmentation with functional loss because the, blood, the drug often stays in the blood after discontinuation. And because I named this ocular manifestations, I wanted to give um, a quick shout out to the, the corneal and glaucoma guys and gals. And plaquenil can also be associated with lens opacification, uh, world keratopathy, which looks very similar to amiodarone toxicity or Fabry's disease and you can also cause ciliary body dysfunction. So I like it when lectures kind of break it up with uh, a few pictures, and so here's just a few more photos from my trip that I took last year, so bear with me, I know I've already shown you a few. So this is Mole National Park up in northern Ghana, some mom and baby warthog. This is on a trip I got to go with, um, with my father and my mother and my sister and brother-in-law to Serengeti one of my favorite photos. And this is a Maasai woman who was just um, in a village outside of the Serengeti. All right, so I wanted to have you take that break so you guys pay attention for the current guidelines <laughs> and recommendations. So this came out in May of 2007, two, sorry, 2011, and it came out because of that study that I just told you about that came out in 2010 that had the 4,000 the 4, patients. Because previous to any of these recommendations, um, the only reference was the physician's desk reference, which said that they should get uh, examinations quarterly. And then in 2002, they came out with these same recommendations, but the study in 2010 verified that this um, is actually a good course to take. So what it is, is that patients should get, a, first of all, a baseline testing right before or right after starting Plaquenil and then annual screening beginning no later than five years after starting the Plaquenil. And there are three things that need to be done. And first is the fundus examination. And that's not because it's sensitive at picking up toxicity, but it's to rule out and to make sure that there's not already retinal tox toxicity before beginning treatment. Uh, a 10 to automated field must be done. And then at least one of, the one of these following objective tests, a multifocal ERG, a fundus autofluorescence, or a spectral domain OCT. And then the American College of Rheumatology in 2012 came out and supported these recommendations. They only added that they should get annual examinations before five years if they're in a high-risk category, which would be, again, if, they are if they've already had more than 1,000 grams cumulative dose or if they are on more than 6.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. So one of the things that they added was the emphasis on counseling. So patients need to be aware that they cannot completely prevent retinotoxicity if they're on Plaquenil. They can only mitigate the damage. Um, they also talk a lot about overdose precautions. They talk about four patient types. The first one is the 
patient with short, short stature um, where the typical dose is too high. So the typical dose is 400 milligrams. Um, and in our patient, 200, sorry, 400 milligrams, which is the typical dose, would put her at 12 milligrams per kilogram today, which is way too much. So, and, and then the other problem is that obese patients are often dosed on weight, which should not be done because the um, hydro hydroxychloroquine is not retaining fatty tissues, and so they can be overdosed as well. They should be based on ideal body weight. And then also patients with liver and renal disease need to be um, watched as Plaquenil is eliminated both through the liver and kidneys. So here is an example that's taken just um, right out of the recommendations. And what it's showing is how these are, there are different sensitivities for these tests. Um, these are all of the left eye, and all the pictures are taken in 2009, um, except for the previous visual fields. And they point out that the visual fields from 2005 to 2008 were deemed insignificant. But they stress the point that if there's any repeats of even any point defects, that it should be considered significant and the patient needs to be counseled at that point about cost and benefit of, this of their medication. And B, they show that the fundus photograph is completely normal and not sensitive at picking up any type of damage. The OCT shows some thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, and then we have some autofluorence in, in that kind of bullseye uh, maculopathy right here. And then in the multifocal ERG, you can see that there's pretty normal wavelengths around the periphery and in the very central, but paracentrally, they are a little bit diminished. So you can pick one of three of these uh, modalities. They, the sensitivity and specific specificity of each one of them has not been determined yet but they are seen as equivalent at this point. So a reminder of our patient, um, her only abnormality, which we don't know for sure is real or not, is these areas of depression here on our multifocal ERG. You can kind of see a little bit better even down in this picture too. Um, and so our plan with her is that, first of all, based on her stereotypical um, sequence of events, we diagnosed her with migraine with aura and we started her on baby aspirin as a prophylaxis and um, told her to continue her board of therapy with ibuprofen and we had her get an MRI brain because she's never had headaches before and they just recently began. Um, and then as far as her plaquenil monitoring goes, because of the unreliable unreliability of her multifocal ERG, we're going to have her return in four months to repeat it. And then if testing is normal, we, be, we will begin the annual testing as the recommendations say in three and a half years from now, which is five years from her start date. And we're gonna counsel this patient. She's someone who's really worried about losing her sight. And um, we're just gonna have to continue to counsel her, her on the fact that we can try and prevent this from getting bad, but, but we cannot prevent it from happening at all, in, at all in the first place. So just really quick where I left off, I kind of left on a melancholy uh, note last time talking about the millions of um, slaves who've exited through Ghana through the slave castles that are seen here. But I just kind of wanted to quickly reverse this and talk about how far Ghana has come um, in just a short amount of time. They gained independence in um, 1957 and only 56 years. They've gained independence. They have uh, free voting for everybody over 18. They have uh, religious tolerance, and they've recently moved from a lower income country to a middle, middle income country. And just some hope for Africa in general. Um, I know I'm passionate about it. I lived there for a year, so I can't help but be really connected with it. Um, Time Magazine, Economist, and there's a lot of books coming out about how um, well Africa is doing. They're still obviously having problems. We're hearing about Kenya, and there's a lot to be done. But economic growth is, um, is, is rising and I believe six out of the 10 uh, fastest growing economies in the world in the last dec decade have come out of Africa and investment in Africa has um, increased tenfold in the last decade. Um, so I think it's an exciting time to see what's gonna be happening in Africa in the future to just give you a, a brighter outlook than last time. Um, so many thanks to the neuro ophthalmology team
Um, I learned so much on, on that rotation. And um, special thanks to Abraham, who's always reminding everybody to get their power bar. And um, thanks to, to uh, Jim here in the front for helping me get on to <coughs> Axis and Donald Krill for his, uh, all his photographs. Um, thanks for Dad for coming to support me from the emergency department. And um, thank you to Alicia. She, uh, there was no spots for me when I first was trying to get into ophthalmology and she <coughs> went to bat for me and I've been able to do all the rotations that I needed to. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all of you. And here are my references. <laughs> Any questions? Dr. Olson? So, this is just not only for you, but for in general. You know, you read all the controversial articles in some places' guidelines. So, like, you know, beat up and mm -hmm. get done here and all that. My point is, is that if you add all of them together, there, there seems to be a little bit that sensitivity is possibly greater to what the whole AARV and then this reading of it. And that's, that's the sense I get from the, if you try to digest it, call the green is the yeah. uh -huh. Multifocal from that is, is probably greater, but it probably has a greater sensitivity to the same origin degradation. Did that's you read the same one? That's probably the point that they were cautious because of data. Yeah. It's yeah. not widely available. And, and the quality in many yeah. parts of the country is yeah. awful. So yeah. because so many uh, general ophthalmologists are doing this that they have to go to an academic center because that's where they're getting the most attention. But it's definitely a challenging problem. A good friend of mine was followed by some very good people at an ADA center and he developed a full-blown, yeah, full-blown toxicity in there. Yeah. And they and they even sat on it when she started saying you you know that you have to get off right now and he said well you know but the problem is with some of these young classmates that she his or her lupus is getting much worse and she's waiting to put her into the back of Yeah, it would definitely be nice if they did, you know, do a bigger study that, that it became standardized with just one of those three tests so that when people are cross-talking about this patient or that patient, there's a standard, but we're just not there yet. It, it's, it's so the data has been coming slowly. Issue, and that's the difficulty of doing uh, a study in these problems that take a long period of time to do. Right. <coughs> Right. Because there's no, there's no company, no, no pharmaceutical company that's going to fund it. Right. It's not going to happen. There's no benefit. Any other? Yes? Another quick question on guidelines. So the two submissions I just did were the cohorts to the left. And then I think that six months to right. But it took time and the confirmation on that in the middle. It took about a month or two. I don't think they were checked. Yeah, I didn't. The, uh, it's easy enough to do, but I'm not sensing that that felt to be very helpful. Yeah, and the, and the, the most recent recommendations basically said that every other test you should not do, aside from those those ones recommended.
I'm trying to I'm trying to pull it up again. I so Yeah, the inner and outer layers, the separation disappears there and thins out. 